Uh, this is a case of a superior mesenteric artery stent. Uh, I'm um, Sumit. I'm one of the IR fellows with Dr. Patel, Dr. Honig, uh, my attendings, Tanya, our tech, Faye, our nurse, Dr. Hamburger, our uh, anesthesiologist. So this patient presented with chronic abdominal pain and weight loss. This is a 61-year-old female with two months of daily postprandial abdominal pain and 20-pound weight loss. She presented with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, with the CT findings suggesting celiac Can you regulate the sheath, please? SMA stenosis. Flat flush. EGD showed erythematous duodenal mucosa, and the colonoscopy showed moderate inflammation Ready? at the colonic the side flush. anastomosis. Uh, she had a right transfemoral diagnostic angiogram to evaluate the celiac and SMA, uh, which were actually negative for median arcuate ligament syndrome, um, but with moderate SMA osteal stenosis. Uh, the post-procedure course was actually complicated by um, uh, access site retroperitoneal hematoma, necessitating ICU admission and blood transfusion. Uh, no intervention was needed to be performed at that time, though. Um, surgical his history significant for CAD, uh, had a cabbage times two, COPD, QT prolongation, uh, questionable bowel obstruction, and had a distal descending colonic resection. Next slide, please. Uh, medications. Uh, for hypertension, GERD, and uh, COPD, vital signs are stable. And, uh, you know, from the surgery, she has a healed midline incision and some right lower quadrant tenderness. Labs are unremarkable. Next slide. So looking down on this CTA, you can see, uh, you know, calcified stenotic SMA uh, and calcium at the celiac ost uh, ostium as well. Okay, next slide. Bell looks unremarkable. So again, looking at the uh, sagittal uh, CTA of the SMA, you can see a pretty tight stenosis there with some calcium at the ostium as well as the celiac. Next slide. And then on the angiogram that was done recently, uh, just about a, a week or two ago, you can see on inspiration and expiration, no significant difference in the celiac. So nothing uh, really consistent with median arcuate there. But at the SMA, uh, you can see a pretty moderate stenosis of the SMA. And as I mentioned, she's got chronic abdominal pain. So this is what we're going to be evaluating. Next slide. So our assessment, it's a 61-year-old female with suspected chronic mesenteric ischemia. And the plan is to get left radial access with the 5-6 slender sheath, which you just saw. Uh, do an SMA angiogram with a 6 French guide cath using the no-touch technique. Um, we're going to get pressure measurements and possibly, based on that, angioplasty and stent. Uh, tell, tell us what you guys have in right now. looks like a seroradial. Seroradial, yep, 5 French seroradial. We got the Barons, uh, sorry, and the Benson down. Um, we already have our runs from before because um, we did a diagnostic angiogram before. So, uh, Dr. Honig did that. So, we're going to exchange this out for the 6 French guide. Can I get the 6 French guide? We need a second side flush. It's ready. Oh, you have a second? Okay. So, when we use the guide catheter, we, we usually, the way I usually set it up, and I think we demonstrated this in the, the last couple of cases, uh, it's all the same. We, we use a sec separate side flush with a port that we can inject through. So, it sort of works like a, like a guiding sheath uh, with, a, with a side arm. And that ten, tends to work really well for complex visceral intervention, either embolization or stenting, where we have to be very precise with our delivery of either embolics or stents. That's what I asked. Um, I think I think in a case like this, the right shape might be the guide a, cap. MP the guide cap. a or a JR4. Which one are you thinking of using here, Rahul? The MP or the um, JR? I think we're going to use the JR4. Her aorta is not that big. Okay. And uh, I think the JR4. Will give us a nice. Like, you know, we're gonna have to nail this yeah, stent it. right at the origin, and I don't want to have the MP catheter jump forward. You know, jump in uh, or push into the SMA, right? Got so, it. Right. So I can pull it back without having to worry about it coming back on us. Uh, this is the type of patient, no. the mesenteric stent patient with atherosclerotic <laughs> disease, huh? that I think is at higher risk for having <laughs> embolic <laughs> events during radial interventions, right? Uh, yeah. So. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to look at the CTA of the of the chest in cases like this. Um, yeah. We you know we no, we don't do that yeah, in every no, case, no, no, but no, I no, think no. people who are high risk, it's completely reasonable to do. I don't know that it would necessarily change what we would do in a case like this because I think for mesenteric intervention, there's a clear anatomic advantage doing. Uh, an above approach, and I think if you're choosing between brachial and radial, uh, it's it's a no-brainer which one would be considered safer and and better for the patient. So, what's your first step here? Are you guys going to try to send a pressure wire out? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to see. I think 
It looked like we were in. Yeah, it looked like we were in for a second. But I think our wi- our Berenstein is in the, or uh, our Benson wire is in. Can I get a 014 stabilizer, please? It's right for here. 180. And can we get the pressure? What type of pressure action do you think you want to use here, Rahul and, and Sean? We're you want trying to... to use the steep lateral, but her arm has been positioned out a little bit further. Yeah, you can't get all the way over. I can't get all the way over. Okay, so this is a, I think this is a good uh, a good point to go over. So with, with a, a radial approach for a mesenteric intervention, the arm, particularly in a lateral, uh, can be challenging. So how, how do people on the panel deal with this? I mean, I know... I know right now the mesenteric interventions are, are sort of favored even among people who do a lot of femoral cases to do them from above. Aaron, can you remind us the guide catheter you're using? The, the so this is a catheter? six French JR4 uh, JR4. guide. Which so, company? It's a 110 it? centimeter. Yeah, you know, there are other guides that are, I mean, there's many guides that are available in the cath lab, but the problem is they're all 100. Uh, this okay. is one of the rare rare birds one. that we've come across that's 110, Sorry. and I think that extra 10 centimeters gives us a situation where we can pretty much do anything in the viscera, whereas the 100 in tall patients is not enough. No, it's really nice. And it's made, what company makes it again? This is Boston, Boston Scientific. So what do you guys think about this stenosis? I mean, from an angiographic oh. perspective, it doesn't look terrible. It doesn't look terrible. It doesn't look as bad as it did on the aortogram. Yeah, it doesn't look as bad as in the aortogram. Mics, can you so... Could it be the angulation that we're yeah, kind of you missing? you have to it normalize okay. here. Oh, that's so so this is where I think pressure it's wires are super helpful. Yeah. Um, we yeah, don't have to, so we don't have to jam this, this six <laughs> French guide catheter across the lesion. Uh, we can just take an 014 yeah, yeah. pressure wire and get a very accurate gradient, probably more accurate, because we can get simultaneous pressures in the wire and the catheter, it's which we can waiting compare for zeroing. on the volcano. So this is always a very frustrating process in our lab because... Uh, we, we hook everything up to the IVIS oh, machine, and then this. that goes directly into the fluoro feed, and it usually requires several Can you go to hookups options? and zeroing. Uh, but once we get the information, it's, it's actually very useful. So one of the things that I've done, Brandon, and, I, and we probably did this together at one point, um, is, is to cross with a, you know, an occlusion no, with maybe a, you know, yeah. a wire you would use potentially in like the leg. Pathway, cause there's not so much a whisper maybe or a fathom and then you buddy wire that put the guide up close to the origin and then try to double or buddy wire the stabilizer or whatever support wire you decide to use secondarily and then take out your initial crossing wire and then run everything over that um you do need to get the guide in, especially in those chronic uh, Hold on, let me really this. severe cases and i don't think this is one of them but if you if you get the guide very close to the origin um yeah. It's going to be it's 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 easier to track the the pressure wire down. Uh, it, it's still going to be easier to track a wire than a catheter across a really high grade stenosis. But obviously, if it's higher grade than this, you may not even need a pressure gradient because it'll be obvious that it's that it's a it's a significant lesion. I think in this case, it's the perfect example where you need to measure a pressure gradient before you do anything. Can you guys uh, zoom in on the? Uh... Can you zoom in on the vital screen? just so we can see what you're looking at. Unfortunately, we didn't hook that up for this case. Right, Next. So, so that's the pressure wire in. And right now, can you see it now, Aaron? Well, so so we can't see it yet, but we're going to we're going to get there. Uh right. but I'll just tell tell you guys know this, but I'll just tell the audience the pressure wire uh plugs the IVIS machine. The transducer is actually at the interface between the radio opaque part and the less radio opaque part. Uh, and so that's where the transducer is. And so that's the area that we have to watch as it's, as it's crossing the lesion to see if there's a translesional gradient. So okay. right now we're getting a gradient of about five, right? Which isn't that much. Uh, so, so yeah, I, actually it's, it, it varies a little bit, but between five and two. So what we're going to do now is just give a little bit of nitro to see if we can accentuate the gradient here. Yeah, yeah. so we got, we got the gradient up to about 8 or 9 with nitro, so she's sort of in that gray zone, right? Uh, so I sort of ask you guys, what do you think about stenting her? Uh, so you, with nitro, it was what, Rahul? Um, it went to about 8 or 9, uh, although it normalized pretty quickly, though. Um, 
but without nitro, it's like two or three. So. I would say leave it. I don't know that. It, I, I don't think it's real. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I could be convinced. Um, yeah. So her celiac and her celiac all, all, is stenotic. It's a little bit stenotic. Her celiac's a little bit stenotic. Her IMA is open, a little stenotic. But uh, you know they're all open. Like she has actually anti-grade flow in her GDA off the celiac. It's not retrograde off the SMA, and there's no fill from the SMA, you know, from the GDA to the SMA, right? So she's not no collaterals there. Right. No. So well, I, think, yeah. I think that becomes a harder argument. I mean, yeah. I think it's easy to create a gradient with nitro in an artificial setting very quickly, and it and it very quickly normalizes. All right, so I think, I, I think you know, just given what everything looks like, and I think we had a decision before we went into this case that we kind of feared she was going to be sort of in this weird gray zone, yeah. um, you know, where she's not going to have much of a gradient, and even with the nitro, it wasn't as... I was, I was hoping for, like, a nitro gradient of, like, 20, not, not 8 or 9. So um, I, we, we, we had actually pre-decided that we weren't going to stent her, but she fell into this category. So I think we're going to not stent her, although the stent is really easy to do, you know, we already set up. All we do is just send the stent. We were going to put a six by eighteen Herculink uh, here. We already we're already across, but uh, there's no CTO. So yeah. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. Guys. It is early, I guess. <laughs> thank you guys. <laughs> thank you.